this. And I think this is one of those um, cases where you have a really great idea and your abstract looks brilliant and then you write the paper and it doesn't quite come out as what you're going to think it's going to be. But, so it's not really talking about the water management, but it is very much about using interdisciplinary approaches, um, I suppose, in a water side industrial complex, which is kind of the key part of this. So we're still okay. I'm not in the wrong session. We're all right. Um, I would meant to add that as, a, as an interdisciplinary uh, scholar, I suppose, I do actually sit at, my, at the moment, I have one archaeologist and one historian as a supervisor. And uh, we were talking about the problems that that entails um, when we head towards trying to find external examiners. Um, we have to try and find a balance of people who can actually uh, examine me, yet still within the awarded an archaeology PhD. So we'll see whether that succeeds or not. <laughs> um, so in this presentation, I'm going to talk through a variety of approaches and source materials that I've been using for my PhD research, and the different perspectives that they've provided on the impacts and effects of the construction of the Chelsea embankment. My research is not necessarily classed as being traditional industrial archaeology. However, the construction of the Thames embankment and the association and the associated main drainage system and pumping stations were undoubtedly one of the major pieces of industrial water management of the 19th century. I and many others have suggested previously that wider social and economic impacts of such industrial projects should be considered more often within the context of industrial archaeological research. And this talk demonstrates that such research provides very different narratives on the process of industrialization. Whilst I'm fairly confident that these, none of these sources or approaches will be new to you in themselves, what I do hope to demonstrate is that the combined value provides a unique perspective beyond traditional archaeological, historical or industrial archaeological approaches. The Thames embankments of central London uh, known as the Victoria, Albert and Chelsea Embankment, are both iconic landmarks and yet relatively unobserved and uncelebrated functional pieces of 19th century industrial water management. The embankment of the River Thames in central London was carried out between 1865 and 1900 as part of a city-wide scheme to improve the sanitation through sewage removal, drainage, quick clean water provision and improvements to the Thames water quality. The embankment construction took place against a backdrop of industrialisation of the waterfront, including the establishment and expansion of factories, shipbuilding and dock facilities. Strangely, there's been very little research on the Victorian embankments, and whilst they are mentioned in a number of histories of London, or pretty much all of the histories of London, um, we find the same series of facts about them repeated with very little critique or discussion. Largely, what's presented is information focusing on the designer, Joseph Bazalgette, and includes the dates of construction and the fact that it contains the sewer. And in one section, this is the Victoria Embankment, um, it also contains part of the Underground Railway. The Wikipedia entry provides an example of this, and you could pick it up and put it down in pretty much every history of London that includes anything on the Thames Embankments. Um, and whilst it is correct, um, there are clearly other narratives and other stories to be told. Um, but I will read it to you because it provides the very basic information and you know, um, you know it provides a bit of context of what we're talking about. So it started in 1862, the present embankment on the north side of the river was primarily designed by Sir Joseph Bazalgette. It incorporates the main low-level interceptor sewer from West London and an, and an underground railway over which a wide road and riverside walkway were also constructed, as well as a retaining wall along the north side of the River Thames. In total, Bazalgette's scheme reclaimed 22 acres of land from the river. It prevented flooded, flooding, but it cut many waterfront houses and buildings off from boat access via their water gates. And what they're referring to here are the houses of the elites who had uh, large gardens that backed onto the River Thames where they could have their own personal boats and stuff. Um, and what they're not talking about are all the working class houses which also backed onto and overhung the River Thames um, which were actually demolished as part of the construction of the embankment. So the entry continues. Uh, much of the granite used in the projects was brought from Lamorna Cove in Cornwall. The quarried stone was shaped into blocks on site before being loaded onto barges and transported up the English Channel into the Thames. From Battersea Bridge in the west, the Thames embankment includes section of Chain Walk, Chelsea Embankment, Groveton Road, Millbank and Victoria Tower Gardens. Beyond the Houses of Parliament, it's named Victoria Embankment, as it stretches to Blackfriars Bridge. 
This stretch also incorporates a section of the London Underground network used by the District and Circle Line and passes Shelmex House and the Savoy Hotel. The embankment also incorporates several stretches of gardens and open spaces collectively known as embankment gardens. The much smaller Albert embankment on the south side of the river, opposite the Millbank Mil section of the Thames embankment, and it was created by Basil Jett for the Metropolitan Board of Works and built by William Webster between July 1866 and November 69, 1869. So whilst all this information is true, it's obviously only a very small part of the story. Um, and what's also really interesting is that whilst it names both the Victoria and the Albert embankment, the Chelsea embankment is very rarely mentioned um, at all. So what I'll present here demonstrates a variety of sources and approaches that I've been using in my PhD research and the way in which they can be integrated to tell alternative stories about the past. So start with local history studies, um, which are very varied. But in Chelsea, there have been two major pieces of work that have been particular use to me. Like most local history studies, the publications are focused on the important people, um, and here those are artists and aristocrats, and the houses in which they lived. In addition to the houses <coughs> of the rich and famous, civic buildings and public spaces are also well documented and researched, including churches, schools, hospitals, and some pubs, coffee houses, and tea houses, coffee shops, and tea houses. One more mundane building that has attracted a lot of interest is Arch House Wharf, which is seen here with the green sign, which is building here, um, next to the old church. The form of the building, um, which had an archway linking down the street to Chain Walk, is often mentioned. However, there seems to be little detail on the history of the building itself and what it was used for. It's clearly a local landmark, however, as it appears on numerous paintings but despite this, it was demolished as part of the Chelsea Embankment works. What's been particularly useful in my research has been the focus within local history studies on landmark buildings, particularly pubs, which has enabled me to more accurately georeference some of the historic mapping, and importantly, orientate the house numbering on streets that's recorded within the census records. This was important as, whilst I had suspected that the street numbering in some streets was sequential up and down streets rather than the normal evens on one side and odds on the others, um, I didn't actually have any proof of this. It was just a gut feeling um, and from the way in which the entries were made in the census records. And without any additional proof, any mapping that I was doing with the census records would have effectively been made up within an individual street. But using the local history research, I was able to identify and geolocate a number of the pubs. Um, I could link those with victuallers, which are what we would call pub landlords, within the census records um, and within the historic business directories. And then additionally, within um, paintings and photographs, um, especially where there was no pub name that was recorded in the census record, it was just their occupation. Um, and the, a lot of the historic mapping in the business directories didn't record all of the pubs, which was a bit strange. They record some to lure you into a false sense of security and then miss out half of them, um, just to be difficult. But by identifying a number of these within a single main street, particularly in Paradise Row, which is one of the major streets in my study area, um, I could work out how the rest of the house numbers for the buildings that were demolished in 1906. And I'll talk about that and show you results in a minute. So whilst it might be easy to dismiss traditional local histories as focused on the rich and famous, within the research lies information which has been of help to me and has helped me to map and understand the lives of those on the back streets and in the unremarkable houses. Um, there have been two major pieces of historical research, like traditional historical research on the Thames Embankment, um, both of which have focused on the engineers, engineering and technology of the construction works. This research was celebratory in its approach exploring the incredible engineering feats and technologies developed as part of the embankment construction works. The focus of historical research within my th thesis, however, has been on the people who were living and working in the areas in which the embankment was built. So instead of using sources written by engineers and various layers of government, I've been using the census records and business directories of 1851, 1871 and 1891 to research those who were directly impacted by the construction. Through the loss of housing, and employment. These sources provide an indication of the social and economic landscape of the area in the 20 years before and after the construction and around the time of its construction in the 1870s. Transcribing and digitising census records for around 4,000 people has provided an incredible insight into the makeup, makeup of the population. Um, I have information about where people came from, the proportion of incomers versus the Chelsea born, 
and the age and gender makeup of the population, birth rates and family size, occupations and indications of family, colleague and friendship networks. For example, we can see groups of young people coming to Chelsea from small towns across the country, including some siblings and presumably groups of friends who are working in the same trade, living together, often with a family member or an older person from the same hometown. And there are many such stories within the data, um, or at least tantalising indications of interesting stories. Um, and a current favourite of mine is a pair of children from two different families who were both born in Australia at the height of the gold rush in 1860 um, and whose family lived next door to each other in Chelsea in 1871. So obviously re researching 19th century London opens up an enormous amount of historical data, but I've chosen to focus on the census data particularly, which provides a fairly egalitarian view of who was living in Chelsea, um, certainly when compared to local history research with its focus on the rich and famous. So the archaeological remains um, obviously play an important, poll in, uh, important role in my research as well. Prior to my research, the only work done on this stretch of foreshore was by the Thames Discovery Programme. Um, and the Thames Tideway work at Chelsea largely took place after I did my field work and was limited to the foreshore that's in front of the Royal Chelsea Hospital. Um, the Thames Discovery Programme uh, field work surveys recorded 24 features between Battersea and Chelsea Bridge. Um, but I was able to increase this to 95 features, including timber posts and structures, barge beds and artefact scatters. The timber posts and structures tie in surprisingly well with the historically recorded commercial wharves, as do the barge beds and artefact scatters. And what is of particular interest to me is the volume of activity that the archaeological material indicates was taking place on the foreshore, which is just not evident from any other source. The barge beds are of particular interest as they're not a feature well recorded or researched, um, they can see, be seen here as the jumble of chalk blocks on the foreshore. Um, so you can't really see them, but these ones here, when they are kind of white, but they're just covered in Thames sludge, basically. Um, but there would be huge areas of chalk blocks. Um, and they would have provided um, a soft and level surface for wooden hulk barges, which were flat bottomed, um, to rest on at low tide. The scale of them suggests that the number of vessels being beached at any one time was far greater than might be assumed from the historic mapping, or indeed from some of the paintings of the waterfront, which present a fairly quiet and bucolic scene. And I'll come back to paintings in a minute. So my first encounter with historical geography was when I first started out on my PhD research and um, a fellow archaeologist dismissed it, my research proposals basically, as just historical geography. Um, I have since then been trying to work out what historical geography is, um, and I'm still not entirely sure that it has a definition as such, um, but it's, it is clear that it includes a huge range um, of research on places and people in the past. Um, I spent an entire day with historical geographers and their research that was presented varied from uh, museum exhibit studies and looking at um, kind of military costumes in the Caribbean, neither of which I would have classified as being geography, let alone historical geography, but um, I'll leave it at that. But one of the things that they obviously do quite a lot of um, are looking at historic maps. Um, that's a bit more sort of classically within the focus of their research. Um, and uh, I did identify uh, one piece of historical geography research by Stuart Oliver, which explored the creation of the Thames embankments as cultural landscapes and an example of controlled nature in the urban space and the embodiment of Victorian narrative of modernisation and nature. Um, the part of my research that most e easily illustrates the value of a historical geography approach is that most traditional archaeological tools, which is map regression. And this approach helps identify changes in the built and natural landscape through time. And in my research, it plays a key role in identifying the physical impacts of the Thames environment construction, particularly in terms of the residential and, com and commercial premises that were demolished. So what has been particularly interesting has been the variation in what was surveyed and recorded on each map, reflecting the aims and purpose of each map. It's interesting to note that on many maps, little attention at all was paid to accurately recording the back streets or the waterfront of the buildings.
So artistic representations of Chelsea in the 19th century are extremely numerous, partly because of the number of artists who were attracted to live in the area, um, for which it's actually you know, obviously quite a famous place. Um, the, water frame was known as, the waterfront was known as being particularly picturesque with its wide roadway and old buildings, trees and various boats on the river. This was both prior to and after the construction of the embankment. These images are a valuable addition to research above and beyond photographs because they provide subjective depictions of the landscape, giving indications of personal perceptions of the waterfront, including what features were considered to be important or picturesque, and interestingly, who was considered important and appropriate to depict as being on the waterfront. As mentioned earlier, these images were also very useful to locate commercial premises based on shop fronts and signage recorded in the paintings. And it was interesting and quite good fun trying to locate a lot of the paintings to accurately um, get the point of view of these paintings and position the scenes with, um, in relation to the historic mapping. The field of digital humanities is an area that I'm just getting to grips with as well. However, the key area of interest it has within the context of my research and interdisciplinary approaches more generally is the focus of the use on digital technologies to mine, visualise and analyse data in order to draw out new patterns and stories about people in the past. My research has digitised the census records, as I said, from 1851, 1871 and 91 to spatially visualise individuals listed within households and addresses in my study area. So in this slide, um, each address is digitised as a red line based on historic mapping and each person is entered as an individual green point. And attached to each of the individual point is all the census record data, so depending <laughs> on what year it is I have, their address, their name, their position or relation to the head of the household, um, their age and occupation um, and place of birth. Um, what this has allowed me to do in my analysis of the data is see links between people that might not have been picked up in traditional readings of census records. Um, so obviously I can run digital queries on things in a way that you wouldn't necessarily be able to do if you were just reading on a microfiche. Um, this slide shows the 1,600-ish entries for 1871, just before the embankment was built. Um, and I've done the same for 1891, but I'm still in the process of putting the 1851 dots on the map. So, um, have a look at what happens when we bring all of these different perspectives together. Um, so the base mapping here that we've got is the 1868 Ordnance Survey map, uh, which was usefully published in 1874, by which time the embankment had been built, so it didn't look anything like this at all. Um, but um, the bright purple shapes um, and the dots that you can see are the census records, so the building outlines and individual people. Um, the additional things that I've mapped here are listed buildings, which are the orange squares, um, but you'll note that there are a load of them that are effectively on the waterfront down here. Um, but they are all um, post-embankment mansion houses. Um, I've also mapped on here schools, churches, hospitals, public houses, green spaces, wharves, docks, piers and river stairs as they've been recorded on the historic mapping um, from around this period. Um, there are also multicolored shapes you can see. Um, that's what these all these um, multicolored shapes inland of the waterfront are. The final addition to this map is the archaeological material. Um, and here on the foreshore, um, we've got the lavender shapes, um, which are artifact scatters, and the blue shapes, um, which are chalk barge beds. Chalk barge beds. Um, the green dots are timber posts, and some of the brown dots are individual fine spots. Um, and their position, obviously located, which is relatively towards the low tide, um, obviously reflects the position of the current embankment wall. And so everything kind of from here backwards has been claimed as within the embankment itself. So what does this piece of seemingly abstract artistry tell us about Chelsea in the immediate pre-embankment period? So the population of these streets here um, was 1,608, of which 873 were women, which is about 54%. Around 36% of the population was aged 15 or under, although this does include 37 girls who were boarding at a school of discipline. Um, discounting those girls, 27% uh, of the 10 to 15 year olds um, were in work, or at least had a listed occupation. Um, and not surprisingly, we find these working children in the smaller working class households on those streets there. 
Um, and there's Queen's Road West, George Place, Calthorpe Place, Bullwalk and at Wolves. Of the total population, 41% of them were born in Chelsea and over half of them who were 50, and just over half of whom were 15 or under. Um, but two of the women who were recorded in the 71 census lived into their 80s, so you get quite a clear indication of the, of the, the demographics of the, uh, at this time. Over one third of the women over 15 didn't work at all. And of those that were working, just over a quarter were either, a la either laundry women or ironers. And the other major occupations included domestic service or making clothes. In addition to understanding details of the population, the census business directory photographs and painting hope to show how this road here was the commercial centre of the community with pubs, bakers, butchers, laundries and other businesses. Many of the owners and workers lived in the same building as the businesses um, and they included apprentices and a number of child workers as well. We can see on the historic mapping uh, that there, there are four wharves marked on the map with associated artefacts, scatters and barge beds and a further two, possibly three wharves um, identified in the census records and archaeological material, which would be Bull Wharf, Gough and Gough House Wharf. Within the census records, there are 37 people, all of whom are men, who worked, for the, uh, worked on the river. Um, some of them are likely to have worked locally in occupations including bargemen, a barge builder, wharf owners, clerks and managers, coal porters, labourers, lightermen and an apprentice, barge crew, steamboat stokers, watermen, and a retired waterman. There were also 30 people who were living at wharf, wharf addresses, some of whom were wharf clerks and managers, but the rest of them had quite a random selection of occupations. The archaeological material also suggests that, in a, that additional shipping activity was taking place immediately to the west, um, beyond the wharves. Um, and this extensive barge bed here measures about 130 metres in length and may be associated with the free dock or the jetty, or, or the jetty associated with the Yorkshire Grey Stairs, which is those in here. Um, and although the free docks kind of recorded don't have really any indication in historical records at all about what was being done there and what the dock was being used for. Um, but the fact that obviously 130 metres is an enormous area um, for um, mooring up boats suggests that there's a huge volume of shipping that's taken place in this place, in this area. So this vision of the riverside, where over a third of the population was under 15, and a large proportion of households belonged to the poorer working class, with numerous wharves and a busy waterfront, con contrasts somewhat with the quiet, adult-dominated, picturesque vision presented by the artistic impressions, where most boats are pulled up on the foreshore, and only a few are obviously working vessels. Furthermore, it provides a vision of the waterfront beyond the traditional narrative of a stinking and sewage-covered foreshore that needed improving and covering with the new embankment. Taking an interdisciplinary approach to this research has provided a more complex view of the social and economic landscape of the pre-embankment pre Chelsea and offers the potential for a very different stories to be told about the impacts and effects of the construction of the Thames Embankment. Thank you.